of the Mason Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 146, covering the week of November 12th through November 16th, 2018. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. Go to our webpage, Abbeville, A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. Give us an email address and we'll give you a free ebook. And you'll also get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. Also, you want to get our free web application or your mobile application I should say. If you go out to your favorite mobile app store, Google Play, iTunes, you can search for Abbeville Institute. You'll come up with our app. It is free of charge. You can download that and you get the Abbeville Institute on the go. You'll have a link to this podcast and that as all as well as all of our audio lectures and mobile access to the website. So you're gonna want to get that too. Also, don't forget that we exist on your generous contributions alone, so you can give a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute. The end of the year is coming up. If you are tax planning for 2018, you can get a little off your taxes by giving a donation to the Institute. We accept monthly or annual donations. Just go to our webpage again, abbevilleinstitute.org. Look for the tab that says Support, and uh, under that you'll see Donation Options. And so click on that, and you can go over and get... uh, Get all the information for that, we, again, monthly or annually for a donation. Also, you can support the Institute by clicking on that same support tab and clicking on the shop part of that. You can go get your Abbeville Institute apparel, embroidered apparel. It is nice stuff. Uh, it's uh, high quality, um, so it doesn't fade in the wash or, you know, where it's a screen print. These are good, high-quality T-shirts, polo shirts, fleece. It's good stuff, hats. So go out there and get your Abbeville Institute apparel and support the Institute that way. And always remember to share our material online. Share it with your friends, rate our podcast, go on out to uh, iTunes or your favorite uh, podcast place where you listen to this podcast and leave a rating. The better ratings, the more ratings, the better. And so we actually move up the list and more people will hear the Abbeville Institute podcast. They'll find it that way. So please help share our message, share our information. It's how we will continue to grow and explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Okay, let's talk about this week. We've come off our conference, which was held in Dallas, Texas this last weekend. I've heard great things about the conference. I didn't attend, but um, I've heard a lot of people say it was one of the best conferences we've ever had. We had over 100 people show up. Uh, Great time. Uh, We had a lot of great speakers, and we have two pieces this week that cover the conference, namely reacting to the leftist reporter who was in attendance who decided to write a hit piece for thinkprogress.org. Um, it was expected. In fact, as I mentioned the piece that I wrote about it, he, he probably wrote it beforehand and then just added some information. I could have written the piece knowing that he was going to be there um, and I, knowing exactly what he was going to say. So it's uh, it'll be a lot of fun to tear this down. But all the pieces this week, with the exception of the book review, which is a little different, but um, all the pieces this week generally have a similar theme, which is um, number one, what does the Southern tradition say about peace? And uh, number two, what is what does Northern imperialism say about peace? And so this is an interesting question. I think that the, the perception that most people get, and you, you hear this all the time, we're heading towards a second civil war. We're having another civil war. We have all these incompatible things in America. We have all these people that don't get along. We have blue states, red states. We have people that are just so divided. And so the real problem is that we need to come back together, unify, come back together. Everybody's got to unify. Well, unify under what? I mean, there are people now that can't see eye to eye on anything because they have completely incompatible worldviews. And you go back to the 1860s, and as John Devaney talked about in the piece a couple of weeks ago, that wasn't necessarily the case. As he said, Americans had more in common in 1860 than they realized. And part of that had to do with the dominance of Christianity in America in 1860, which does not exist anymore. It's not just that Americans are politically divided over, you know, what do we want the government to do? Do we want it to provide health care? Do we want it to, uh, you know, 
control guns? Do we want it not to control guns? Do we want to have a situation where we don't have government provided health care? I mean, these are those are political questions. But in the, at the end, most of the people that push those positions are nationalists in one way or another. They believe the central authority should do something, whatever their pet project is. So they're unified in this commitment to nationalism. But when you commit to nationalism in that way, you commit to a one-size-fits-all policy, a one-size-fits-all government, and that's going to create conflict. And that's what people don't understand. That creates substantial political conflict. And at the end of the day, that political conflict cannot be resolved because we do have people that have fundamentally different views about society, on the left and the right. Uh, and not just that, I think people even in the middle. I mean, a lot of people in the middle... Uh, are concerned about the direction of things, particularly as we go either far left or far right. They don't like that. And so we've lost that middle, so to speak. I mean, these people that are there, they're just, you know, they're going out there, they're just working every day. They just, they just want to uh, take care of their kids and, and have good education for their families and, and go on a vacation here and there. And they don't want to pay exorbitant amounts of money in taxes. They do want to have some health care. They want to have some things. Most Americans are just, as long as they got the house and the car, and you know they're they're doing okay. Most Americans really don't get involved with all of the nonsense that takes place in American politics, particularly on the fringes on both sides. Okay. But I think one thing that concerns the, the the general population is a far left move in terms of social and cultural issues in America. They also don't want to you know have the violence uh, that could come from the other side as well. I mean, look, the left is very violent. Uh, and then we've seen how the identi identity politics on the right and the left affect people when it comes to violence. So we've seen this, right? Um, the left is usually the more violent set group, by the way. So we've seen this happen. And most Americans don't want to be involved in any of that. They, they don't like any of that stuff. But they also understand that perhaps, you know, live and let live would be the best thing. So when you start looking at these at these factions and how the left, the, the far left, has really become dominant in the Democrat Party, um, and of course the, the left would say that the far right has become dominant in the Republican Party. Not even close. I mean, the Republican Party is still the Republican Party. <laughs> um, it's not even close to that. Um, we do have a situation where we're, we're, we're having incompatible things. And so would secession actually prevent a war not cause a war. The only reason it would cause a war is if people said, well, you can't do that. You see, secession didn't have to cause a war in 1861 either. Lincoln could have said, okay, you're out. We've lost seven states. We'll keep the rest of the Union together, and maybe at some point these seven states will realize they've made an error. As Winfield Scott said, you want those states back in the Union? Just blockade the, the ports, and they'll come back in because they won't be able to survive without being able to export their cotton and import goods. I mean, they'll 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 wither away that way. They'll come back if you want to back in. You don't have to shoot at them. So if that was simply, um, we could have we could have avoided the war that way. Lincoln made a conscious choice though to go to war. So the war didn't have to happen. There's there's I think this is a question that people don't ever ask. Well, why did we actually have a war? Um, and Lincoln's main purpose was to, quote, preserve the Union. Now, did you have to take that position? Could you have said, okay, these people are wrong. Uh, we'll just, well, they'll realize the error of their ways and they'll come back. This is essentially what Jefferson said in 1801 when he was inaugurated as the third president of the United States. He said, look, you got these people out there running around saying they're going to secede in the North. Well, let them talk about it. Let them, I mean, Heck, if they even tried it, they're going to see the error of their ways. You see, that's that's the peaceful position on secession. And we've seen peaceful secession all over the world. What we haven't seen is peaceful secession here in America. What we haven't seen is Americans believing in their own principles. And so people will say, well, you can't do that. It's unconstitutional. This was a voluntary union. Obama, that wasn't voluntary in Great Britain. And the two things aren't equal. And the Constitution is illegal. And, and uh, uh, you can't do that. You just can't. It's treason. It's, it is a hyper-emotional response to this idea of secession. Because, of course, it's all about race and slavery. That's the only reason people want to secede. What about progressives that want to secede? And there's a lot of them. Progressives that want to secede. What about those people? 
Are they doing it because of race or something else? Well, I mean, think progress will say it's just a Russian plant. It's just a Russian plot to break apart the United States. I think progress is such a goofy website. And the, and the man who runs it is such a goofy individual. If you go out and follow him on social media, he really is a complete nimrod. But I digress. Um, regardless, we have this, this belief that somehow secession has to create violence. And some of that has to do with the way that the North, of course, prosecuted the war. Our piece on Monday, entitled A Return to Barbarism by Norman Black, gets into this. The, the position of the United States vis-a-vis -vis foreign powers and how... He, he brings up a wonderful book, by the way, Lawrence Keeley's War Before Civilization. If you haven't ever read this book, I, I remember I had a colleague of mine who taught uh, biology. He was, uh, he was African and uh, a very nice man, uh, loved to talk about history and philosophy, and, and he was interested in things outside of the hard sciences. And I remember he grew up in a, in a very violent society um, where it was interesting to talk about how the regime where he lived would uh, kill people for teaching uh, things outside of the sta of state approval. They would actually kill you for doing it and slaughtered many people in his own village. When he went off to graduate school, he had one textbook for the entire class. I mean, it was an interesting story. The guy grew up in really hard times and um, came to the United States. And one of the things that he believed in, I think fundamentally believed in, was that humans were inherently good and that if it wasn't for government, wasn't for government, people would all get along. And I think that was based primarily on his experience. And so I remember talking to him about this book by Keeley, War Before Civilization. I said, look, you really need to read this because what you'll find in that book is that, no, this isn't true at all, that civilization has actually made people less inclined to violence. Um, and that humans before civilization were very, very violent. And it actually changed his mind. He sat down and read it. He said, that was a fascinating book. I never thought of things in this way. That it was actually the, the regime, the government in his home country that was making things bad and making violence worse. Um, uh, but it was, it, it was that. But they never, he never thought about the fact that if the government wasn't there, you would still have violence. I mean, his, his, his perspective and things and how that was created, you know, created this, this image of society and government that was a bit skewed. Now, we can talk about governments have always had a monopoly on violence, and that's what this piece of Return to Barbarism gets into, and how nasty war became um, in the modern era with things like nuclear bombs and mustard gas and chemical warfare and all these things. And, of course, the total war tactics of the Lincoln regime and carrying out this war against the South. And how that was, that we had gone away from that in some ways. Um, now, we'll run a piece in a couple of weeks on the Libra Code and some other things that were happening at the same time. And how there was actually an attempt in the 1860s to uh, lessen the evil side effects of war. It didn't last, and of course World War I was even more nasty. But regardless... Um, the Western world had always had a, a desire to have civilized warfare. I mean, if, in, during the American War for Independence, if you turned your back on the enemy and started walking away, they didn't shoot you. That was, that was the rules of combat. And, of course, as you saw in the Middle Ages and then the Renaissance period, there started, we had all these codified rules of combat. And so things were, were changing. Um, but a lot of that went away during the war, and civilians became a primary target. And I think that is the... the um, real downside of modern warfare, the collateral damage. And, of course, this piece ran on Monday the 12th, which is the day after Armistice Day, now known as Veterans Day. But Armistice Day is should be a celebration of peace. But as we've seen with the United States and being involved in um, the massive wars of the 20th century, uh, the United States has become just as much a proponent of this collateral damage as any other empire ever has been. And so the Lincoln administration, the North and their policy of total war or occupation of the South really inaugurated this in the modern age, 150 years ago. The war, the, what's often called the first modern war, which was the Crimean War before that, you didn't see that as much. And of course, you could go back into the Middle Ages, look at the Hundred Years' War, it's a nasty war. The Thirty Years' War was a nasty war. The Hundred Years' War in particular 
was very much a war, a total war in terms of the civilian population. But even that, there were still rules between the armies. Um, but when you get to the modern age, you don't see them as much. I mean, you see entire towns just blown apart. Um, horrible stuff. So um, it's an interesting piece. And the piece on Friday kind of piggybacks on that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over the, the Wednesday and Thursday pieces for a second. But the piece on Friday... Um, which is entitled Securing the Blessings, Today the South, Tomorrow. And it was written by Ludwell Johnson back in the, um, in the late 80s, 1989. Ludwell Johnson's uh, been deceased for, for several years. Um, and this is an interesting piece because it gets into the religious fervor that led to the war, that led to... Um, this nasty situation in the 1860s and how it really was motivated by a puritanical zeal to conquer the south and it was but the thing was it was all about image over reality he calls it the slave power conspiracy because it was as he points out the slave power didn't really control anything slave owners didn't really control much at all they didn't control the government uh, there were very few slaves in the west there was no slave power at all. Uh, but this is something that people often say, well, it's the slave power leading the, leading the South and leading the United States, and that's why we have the war, because of slave power. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people that uh, push this particular agenda now. For example, you have a professor at Princeton named Matthew Karp. I mean, this is where he's, he's made his career, that it was all just the slave power driving American foreign policy, driving America... It's, it's completely bunk, but it's, it's simply, simply revitalizing this 1850s narrative of America. It's not, nothing new. What they've done is just bought the 1850s narrative, uh, which was wrong. Um, and so I think that, uh, the, and of course, he's, he, he says, well, you can't, when, when you bring up the fact that Calhoun didn't support American expansion. Well, no, yes, he did. He never really voted against it. He might have said he was against it, but he never voted against it. In his private correspondence, he was all for it. Um, I would actually side with the leading Calhoun scholar in the United States, Clyde Wilson, over Matthew Karp. But that's just me. Um, I mean, Clyde Wilson might know a little bit about Calhoun, and his position is drastically different from Karp's. So, um, regardless... Uh, but this is where we are, and and Johnson takes this apart, and he he, he essentially uh, you know, looks at these things in a cultural movement, the millennialist movement. You know, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the war, Lord, and you know, you ha and he brings this up and, and how that carries forward into American foreign policy in the late 19th century, and then to the 20th century, into the Cold War, into World War II, and he he, he traces this belief in an expansive American foreign policy and an expansive policy of bringing about the um, the end of days, so to speak. I mean, people were talking about this. It's going to be the end of days. If we don't do something, it's the end of days. Um, and how that how that's created a very violent society for America, uh, both in terms of foreign and domestic policy. A puritanical zeal. Uh, you see it in American foreign policy. You see it in American military policy. And when you, when you have that, there has to be an enemy. There has to be an evil. And in 1860s, it was the South and the slaveholder. And then, of course, you move forward in time, and it became some other, you know, some other entity that had to be the, the evil other, whether it was the Soviet Union, the Nazis, the, the Germans, uh, the Spanish. I mean, you take your pick of the enemy of the United States, and, of course, it becomes a puritanical zeal to root these people out and destroy them. And as, as Johnson points out, well, there were some, I mean, look, the Nazis were bad people. The Soviets were bad people in terms of the regime, not the, not the Germans themselves, the people, the German people or the Russian people, but the, the, the regime was bad. Um, but did the United States always have to go to war in these particular situations was always the question. And that brings us back to secession. The way that, that people that advocate decentralization are portrayed is they're demonized. These people are bad people. They're evil people. And that, that Think Progress piece that is so awful essentially says that. When Look, these people are all bad, 
and these people are these things. Um, and it's uh, it's just it completely uh, boggles the mind how anyone could go to the conference and come away with that. Um, and so when I the, the thing I focused on in my piece where I said you know, the the Southern political tradition is winning is is the title of my uh, piece, and people have laughed at this title. You know, no, we're not. We're not winning. No, we're really not winning. And I point to the fact that um, a man named Matthew Whitaker has been appointed acting attorney general of the United States and that Jeff Sessions, of course, got fired. But Whitaker is uh, is a nullifier. At least that's what he said when he was uh, campaigning for office in 2014. He's from Iowa. Jeff Sessions from Alabama. Whitaker is from Iowa. And uh, here you have a guy that openly supported nullification. Now, he's talking about Obamacare when he said it. But he said, look, the states need to have some courage and stand up to this thing. That's a refreshing departure from, well, it's, it's the rule of law. The national government says this and this. And so there it is. Uh, of course, CNN published a hit piece on this particular uh, issue and that Whitaker supported these things. He also had the nerve to say that he didn't support Marbury v. Madison. <gasps> Of course, the, the gatekeepers of acceptable thought in America have said these two things are just completely awful. You can't say these things. Actual historians, legal scholars, they, they jumped all over this. But the most important takeaway from this is not, not that, but the fact that here's a guy publicly saying that he supports nullification, and that means the Southern tradition is winning. It's gaining traction. More and more people are coming around to this. The conference that we had over the weekend is an example of that. People on the left and the right are coming to see, you know, this thing is just too big. Maybe we need to talk about decentralization, federalism, nullification. We need to talk talk about things that would actually create a peaceful political environment, not a violent environment. Because if we could just live and let live, you can vote with your feet. I don't like the laws of my state. I don't want to be in California. I'll, I'll move. I don't want to be in Texas. It's too right-wing. I don't want to be in Alabama. I don't want to be in Massachusetts, whatever your political... Uh, perspective is these states don't fit my political worldview, so I'm going to move to a different state. But of course, this particular reporter could have written this thing ahead of time because you mentioned white supremacy in the Confederacy, you mentioned the SPLC, you mentioned segregation and slavery, you mentioned John C. Calhoun and George Wallace. I mean, what this guy really thinks is that people with just with any more than a quarter of a brain will actually believe these things. I mean, I know his, his readers probably do because they don't have more than a quarter of a brain. But most people look at that and say, God, this is just stupid. And, of course, you got people saying, I've been tracking the Institute for years. Tracking us how? I mean, everything we do is free. It's all out there. Oh, you, oh what do you do? You go to our website? Oh, wow. That's really amazing. <laughs> Ooh, that took a lot of work to track us. Uh, it's like we exist in these dark corners somewhere and have all these secret conferences with secret individuals and secret papers. We don't do any of that. He failed. The reporter who, who talked about this thing failed to mention that two of the seven speakers were leftists and that Michael Bolden um, talks about Rosa Parks as an, as, an, as an example and an inspiration for nullification. Boy, that's some white supremacist rage right there. I mean, talking about Rosa Parks really shows these these people are just sticking it to people. I mean, they just they just want to beat down minorities. Yeah, because you know Rosa Parks <laughs> really shows that. Um, I mean, most people that walk away from our conferences uh, get the impression the Southern tradition is important and it's positive and it's valuable. And that, yes, we do talk about things that are seem to be you know out of touch, out of step with with the mainstream. We talk about Southern symbols. We talk about individuals who are often demonized. Calhoun, for example. And we, we're, we're very... Uh, look, John C. Calhoun was the most important political, original political thinker of the 19th century, perhaps in American history, but the most original political thinker of the American 19th century. People from all over the world still study Calhoun for his views on government. An original political thinker. No one in the North could make that claim. Not like Calhoun could. Um, so he's an important guy and someone that everyone should listen to. Um, so you walk away from our conferences and you can't help but feel there's a positive thing. going. People don't talk about anything negative. We, we have positive conferences with positive messages. And we talk about things in the Southern tradition, whether it's the music, food, literature, and art, or the political tradition, or the symbols, 
Um, we talk about things in the Southern tradition that are important for the modern age. Um, and this is why this piece was just so stupid. The individual is just an idiot. So, you know, I, I said that. And, of course, then we had a piece by Matthew Silber, who actually attended the event. And his title was Diffusing a Second Th Civil War Through Peaceful Secession. He brings us up. Look, you, Marcus Ruiz Evans, who was the one of the speakers from Cal Exit, um, said, you know, this we just need to live and let live. Um, he said, we can't sit on the sidelines. This isn't a left or right problem. This is an everyone problem. Um, but even if it, he said, quote, but even if we may not agree, we can support your right, irregardless of left or right, to have your own community. We should be proud of who we are and be able to live in peace. Isn't that a wonderful message? Let's live in peace. Stop worrying about what happens six states over. I mean, of course, when you have terrible disasters like what's going on in California, when you have terrible wildfires, or you have terrible disaster that happened in Florida with a hurricane, when you have these things, all Americans feel bad about that. They'll donate. They'll give. They'll say, you know, we're going to help these people out. That wouldn't stop if Americans had a much more decentralized political system. It wouldn't stop. Americans would still say, you know, gosh, those poor people in California are suffering. We need to help them out. Those poor people in Florida are suffering. We need to help them out. That wouldn't stop. No one would stop doing these things. This is the idea. Oh, somehow, I mean, if we don't have the we don't have this union that's this big and these amount of miles and this nobody's gonna everybody's gonna fight with each other. Actually, it would be the exact opposite. I think people would stop fighting with each other and start saying, "Gosh, you know those those poor people. Let's let's help out those Californians. They're not they're not trying to govern us anymore, so we, we can like them again." Which is amazing. Now. I mentioned that um, we had a book, uh, one of the pieces this week was, seemed kind of out of step. Um, it's a visit to Claybank County. It, it's sort of out of step. It's a review of four of uh, Dr. Jim Kibler's books, Walking Toward Home, Memories Keep, The Education of Chauncey Doolittle, and Tiller. Tiller is the most recent publication through Shotwell Publishing. Again, get your Shotwell Publishing book. Um, but this is a, a story of place and people and a real community. You know, Jim Kibler lives in a uh, refurbished plantation home in, in South Carolina. And this is, this is a story of his place and his people. And so when you read this, I mean, that's, that's really what this is all about. You can't, have, you can't have decentralization. You can't have secession and nullification without real people and a real place and a real culture. And that's what Evans said. You know, we have a real community here. This is what Silver said in his piece, too. He's driving through areas of real communities and real people. And they may not see it eye, eye to eye on things, but, you know, they can live and let live. And these people in this Claybank County, which is all fictional, but still it's a real place based. I mean, it's, it's Faulkner. I mean, Kibler is, is built these novels on a very uh, a foundation of Faulkner, which if, of his community in Mississippi, here we have Kibler's community in South Carolina. And that's what the reviewer, Robin Spencer Lattimore, is talking about here. Real people, real place, you have to have that. You have to have something tangible to hold on to. In a, uh, in a decentralist situation, there's a reason why these people were talking about decentralization, north and south in the 19th century, because they had a, a real place and a real community that they believed was being threatened by one side or the other. Could have been a boogeyman, but they still believed it was being threatened. They were holding on to something real, not something fabricated. And you can't have these ideas, you can't have these principles, you can't have these things work without something real and tangible to hold on to. But it all comes down to peace. It all comes down to peace, and I think we forget that when we start talking, because we didn't have to have war in the 1860s. We didn't have to have this American empire. We didn't have to have this aggressive, aggressive American foreign policy. None of that had to happen. That was a byproduct of the, of the zeal, of the reformist zeal of the middle of the 19th century, manifested in a uh, view of religion, um, in some cases, um, that was alien to uh, the American political tradition of decentralization. It was take my culture and like it or die. 
You have to agree with us or you die. Is that peace? Is that, is that something that we should be pursuing in American history? Is that something we should be pursuing today in American policy? It's a good question. One that I think decentralization and secession can, can uh, you know, address. One that live and let live, or as I say in my podcast, think locally, act locally. One that that particular belief set can address. Stop worrying about everybody else's doorstep and sweep around your own. Take care of your family. Again, most Americans just want to have a, li- a decent life. And they just want to be left alone, and they want to rear their children, and they want to have an education, they want to have the life that they think is, is good and valuable and true. That's what most Americans want. Across the spectrum. And to do that, uh, if we left each other alone, it would be a lot more peaceful, a lot more encouraging, and just a, a, lot, a, more, a more, much more stable society. If you have an aggressive domestic and foreign policy, you can't have that. And if you believe that people need to be exterminated, like you see with total war, you can't have that either. And of course, the Lincoln regime inaugurated that in America in the middle of the 19th century, and it's carried forward across the globe. Hope you enjoyed this week in review at the Abbey Bill Institute. Until next time, good day. Good day.